50-minute sermon. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, and we are going to continue in our series of the Decalogue. I want to thank uh, Pastor Kyle for, man, I, I will tell you what, I, I watched that sermon too. I don't miss. I, I mean, I engage. This is my church, man. And, uh, and Pastor Kyle did a, a phenomenal uh, job preaching the second commandment. Just a great, great job. There you are, buddy. I see you there. Thank you for, for uh, representing this pulpit well. And uh, Pastor JC, uh, awesome man. Great job, Pastor. Just there he is in the back. Thank you for, uh, for doing that well. As he, he handled the fourth commandment. Uh, the Sabbath day, keeping it holy, and uh, and I will tell you, and he did mention that uh, he skipped the third one because that was my request, and I'm the boss, so I get to do what I want, and um, and so I uh, I've really this I wanted to preach the third commandment because it's one that's very dear to me, and they're all dear to me, but I want to share this one with you, and and we're going to get right into the word today. In the book of Exodus is when uh, Moses is given these Ten Commands. And in chapter 20 is the first time that we actually hear the commands uh, being uttered. And uh, God says this in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7. He says, Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. For the Lord will hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Father, I just pray your anointing over these next few minutes. Lord, what a special, special touch we've had today from you. Lord, we could go home right now and be totally filled, God, because you've done a great work today. But Lord, I pray that for these next few minutes that you would also fill our hearts, Lord, with the power of your word, and that we would leave here armed, Lord, with the sword of the Spirit. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. When I say Elon Musk... Things come to mind, probably Tesla, SpaceX, and ironically, Twitter. (laughs) Um, If I say Jeff Bezos, you think of Amazon, right? When I think, when I say Donald Trump, there are a lot of things that come to mind, (laughs) a lot of things. Equally, when I say names like Nancy Pelosi, AOC, and Joe Biden, other things come to mind. (laughs) It all depends on what side of the aisle that uh, that you stand on. If I, if I sit with my brother Kyle and I say things like maple pecan coffee or Christmas decorations, this guy goes to a whole nother level of happiness. Do you know he's already been to the store and already bought his fall decorations? That's, that's his love, man. That's his love. He's ahead of the curve. I love it. I, I, I don't really love it. I think he's weird, but I love that he's weird. But when we hear names and when we hear uh, uh, sports teams, some sports teams get you all excited and others, and others get you all upset, right? Uh, there's very distinct images and emotions that come to mind when you hear a name. When you hear the name of a loved one, you feel joy and happiness. A smile comes upon your face. But when you hear the name of somebody who's hurt you, you have an adverse reaction. There's feelings and there's emotions that you don't like that come back to the surface. In, uh, in psychology, this is called paired association. And, and so you see, whether, whether, you, whether your association is right or not, your perception of that person is attached to their name. And we all know that perception is our reality. How you perceive something becomes your reality. You see, names have great significance. We're, we are identified by our names. And frankly, we don't like people mispronouncing our names or calling us by the wrong name. My wife's name is Jeanette. She hates it when I call her Janet. There's nothing wrong with the name Janet. That's just not her name. So she doesn't like it. So when I want to get under her skin... But I never, ever do that. (laughs) My last name is Willis. When I introduce myself to people and I say, hey, my name is Chris Willis, inevitably the first thing they say is, what you talking about, Willis? (laughs) Or if they're really funny, they say, oh, are you related to Bruce? I'm like, no, I'm not. But in biblical times, 
they had very special meanings. Names meant something. Your name would describe your character, your attributes, the things that you did or did not do. They, they would, your name would change upon, upon your activity in life. And, and so that's why Abram was changed to the name Abraham because he became the father of many. Um, his wife Sarai who was barren until she was in her 90s, became Sarah, which means the princess of Canaan. Jacob was the circumventor. Esau was named Esau because he was hairy. Jesus' name means healer or physician, savior. Judas means traitor. Saul means prayed or asked for. If you remember, the people wanted a king, and so they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, which means prayed for or asked for. Simon, his name was changed to Peter, which is actually pronounced Petra. And Jesus said, upon this Petra, upon this rock, I will build my church. His name means rock. You call me Pastor Chris. I carry a title here at the church as the pastor, the shepherd of this congregation. And by addressing me as pastor, you're acknowledging that there is honor in the office that I hold. Many times in my career, parents have corrected their children and make sure that they address me as pastor because, I, I, and listen, I'm not hung up on titles. I'm comfortable with the moniker PC. A lot of you call me PC, and I'm fine with that. In short, that stands for Pastor Chris. Ironically, I've never used a PC computer. I'm a Mac guy, but we call it PC. Um, but there, there have been many people who just absolutely refuse to call me Chris or PC, not because I'm anything unique or anything special, but the office that I hold is, and many people feel that it needs to be respected as such. Did you know that when someone hears your name, that immediately images and feelings and emotions come racing into their, their mind and into their spirit? Based upon who you are, the things that you do. Your name evokes emotion. And, and, and whether, you're, whether those emotions are good or whether they're bad, it's all paired associations. So when we think about this third commandment, when we think about the name of God, we've got to understand something. We need to understand what's in a name. To God... Everything's in his name. It matters to him how we address him. When we think about God and we think about his character and we think about his nature, it is all wrapped up in his name. So the question is today, as a follower of Christ, and so if you're a Christian and you proclaim Jesus as Lord, then, and guess what? When you become a Christian, people are watching you. And they're watching your behavior. And they're watching the things that you do and the things that you say and the places you go, the things that you participate in and the things that you don't participate in. And if it colors outside the lines of their perception of what a Christian should be, you know what their response is? I thought you were a Christian. And so the question is, as a follower of Christ, as a son or a daughter of God, how... Can we bring honor to God's name? How can we cause people to think about things, uh, th think about the things that truly represent God when they hear his name or when they simply hear us speak? Eugene Peterson wrote um, the message. It's a paraphrase of the Bible. It's not a true translation of the Bible. But uh, in, his, uh, in this paraphrase, he, he writes this of Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. He says, there's no using the name of God, your God, in curses or silly banter. God won't put up with the irreverent use of his name. I think that's a pretty accurate paraphrase, if you will. See, the reason why is because God is supremely and totally holy and righteous. And his name deserves our respect. And our relationship with him is an honor. It's an honor and a privilege to be a Christian. And, and so he's worthy of our respect. 
He's worthy of our humility. In the book of Leviticus, when the law, when the uh, law was all being uh, uh, translated and, and given to the people, uh, the, the, in Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 10, we read a story about two men who got into a fight. And during that fight, one of the men basically cursed God's name. They used his name in vain. And this is what God tells Moses as a result of, so, okay, so hear me. This is the equivalent of you're, you're, you're um, hammering a nail and you miss the nail and hit your thumb. And stuff comes out that shouldn't come out, right? That's what's happened. These guys get in a fight. Anger ensues. And the guy, because how many times do you say, well, I didn't mean to. That's not what I meant. He is so holy. God is so holy and should be reverenced so uh, much that, that here was his response. God tells Moses in response, he says in verse 15, If anyone curses his God, he will be held responsible. That's what the commandment said. You, you, you will not go unnoticed. Verse 16, anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. The entire assembly must stone him. Now, wait a minute. So you're saying, can you imagine this? You accidentally swear in, the, in God's name, and the duty of the entire church is to go to your house, pick up rocks, and throw them at you until you die. If we still held that standard, there would no, we would not have problems with rocks in our gardens anymore. There would not be enough rocks in Connecticut. We are living in a different day and age. And Leviticus illustrates just how serious God is about his name, though. Profanity and cursing, coarse joking. As a Christian, listen, that's another whole sermon. But... But, the, but speaking profanities and curses and, and even coarse joking, it has no place in the speech of those who consider themselves followers of God. Your, your tongue is a powerful tool, and it should be used, the Apostle Paul says, to prophesy. Which, in that, in that context, it means to edify one another, to lift each other up, to encourage the brothers and sisters. Let your voice use this tool to build up. This is why the Bible says the greatest command in all the, in all the Bible is to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. You wouldn't curse yourself out. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say all kinds of horrible things like that about yourself. And the, and the Bible is saying, use your instrument, this tool, use it to build up other people, to lift them up, to encourage them, to, to not speak to the negativity. They're already having enough problem with the negative things being infiltrated in their life. They don't need Christians reminding them. What they need is us pointing them to the answer, and his name is Jesus. So as Christians, if, if we use God's name in our speech to make sure you use it appropriately, use it reverently, honor him with reverence when you use his name. Most of the time, people talk about using the Lord's name in vain with swearing. And of course, it is that, and I'm going to address that in just a moment, but to understand the enormity of, of this commandment, you have to understand why violating this commandment results in a death sentence in the Old Testament. We got to understand how, and I'm so grateful we live in an age of grace and mercy, aren't you? Amen. I've struck my thumb one too many times in my life. But, but I will tell you that, that we can see all throughout Scripture just how highly God reverences his name. And so when Moses first gets his instructions to go to Egypt, which is where the Ten Commandments come from, Moses goes and there's a burning bush, and God speaks to him through this burning bush. And he says, you go to Pharaoh, you tell him to let my people go. And so in Exodus chapter 3, Moses starts 
this conversation. And God says, um, God says in, in verse 13, I, um, Moses says, when, when I go to Pharaoh and I tell him to let my people go, they're going to ask who sent me. Who do I tell them sent me? And this is God's response in verse 13. You, he said, you tell them, I am that I am has sent you. He didn't give them just one name. He said, he said look, the one who was with you sent you. The one who was present sent you. I am accessible and I sent you. The one who is near the oppressed sent you. The one who is the deliverer, the guide, the comforter. I'm the one that's sending you. The one who is presenting for you a hope and a future. I'm the one that's sending you. The one who always has been, who is, and who always will be. I'm the one that's sending you. Come on, church. And then he goes on and he speaks and he says, I am El Eloha, the God mighty, strong, and prominent. I am El Elohim. I am God the creator. I am El Shaddai. I am God almighty. I am Adonai, which means Lord. I am Jehovah, the Lord of all. I am Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Come on, some of you who were in this altar today, you need to be reminded of just who your Lord is. He is Jehovah Nisi. That is your victory, church. He is Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord who sanctifies and makes holy. I am Jehovah Shalom. I am your peace. I am Jehovah Elohim. That means I am the Lord of all lords. Come on, somebody. I am Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord of righteousness. I am the Lord Rohi, the Lord our shepherd. He is Lord. You tell him that's who sent you, Moses. I am that I am. And there are many other names that God uses to describe himself and his attributes all throughout Scripture. In fact, roughly 950 of them. You can look them up. There, if you look them up in alpha, do this, do a search. Names of God in alphabetical order. You'll see it starts with Abba, which means daddy, right? And he ends with Zur, which means the rock. He is he's everything in between. He is, he is the comfort and the loving father, and he is the rock on which you can stand and be successful and have a life more abundantly in this earth. So when you ask what's in a name, why does this even matter? It's no big deal. Well, I think God has gone to great lengths to make sure that his name is never misinterpreted, misrepresented by his people. He expects us to honor his name, to live up to his name, to be a reflection of his name. When his name's on the line, he wants you to think about his attributes when somebody uses his name, it should evoke reverence in their heart. When you speak the name of Jesus in a crowd, people should understand that you are bringing glory and honor to him, not talking about our God flippantly. There should be a blessed assurance that he's enough, no matter what I'm facing. I love it when I, I'm talking to people. Some, sometimes when I counsel with people, it's nothing more than listening. And I love it. I've heard many people say this throughout the years. They go through and they're talking about all the difficulties. And then they'll just stop and they'll say, but God. And they are taking a moment and they're referencing and they're recognizing, I am that I am. He is more than enough. He's your portion. He's your counsel. He's your provision. Just the very mention of his name. That's why I had you say the name Jesus earlier. Just to stop and just say, I mean, when you, I'm serious. I can't, I, I speak the name of Jesus Hundreds of times throughout the week. And I don't do that because I'm a pastor and that's what I'm supposed to do. I do it because I'm a man and I need to lean in on the Lord. Because sometimes all I have left is to throw up my hands and offer a hallelujah. It's all I've got. Originally the Hebrew scriptures were written with no vowels. Only consonants. And eventually, the Jewish people became concerned that the people would forget how to uh, read scriptures if they did not insert vowels into the reading. So they added vowels with the consonants. And when they were inserting the vowels around the consonants, they came across a four-consonant name for God 
which was revealed to Moses. Y-H-W-H in English. The scribes felt that this name was so holy that they could not add consonants to it. So they, revere, they, they, they re revered it so highly that they didn't insert any vowels there. And eventually, the Jews did not even attempt to pronounce his name, Yahweh, lest they profane his name. When Yahweh appeared in a passage, the reader would say Hashem instead. That means the name. They, they wouldn't even say the name. See, reverencing the holy name of God has always stuck with me. I, I remember hearing that story about the consonants and the vowels when I was in junior high. Which is why it's important, church, that we are always, always investing in the next generation. Understand that, that your children are listening, and they're watching, and they're learning, and they're growing. That's why every time these doors are open, your kids need to be in church. Even if they're kicking and screaming, I don't want to go to church. That pastor's so boring. Blah, 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 blah. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You know why? Because somehow, some way, the, the power of God's word gets into their heart. And when they grow old, they will not depart from it. Amen? That's the only confidence I have because I'm like, Lord, I come up here and I just spew drivel and they somehow get blessed by your grace. But the holy name of God always stuck with me. And I learned something about my wife as she was writing her, her book uh, recently. And I learned that there's something that we do similar. I didn't know this about her and she didn't know it about me. But all throughout her book, if you read it, you'll, you'll notice that Every time the name of God or Jesus or he or any reference to, to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit is always capitalized. And that's a, that's a practice that I've, in every sermon I've ever, ever written, always capitalized. And the name Satan, I always put in lowercase. <laughs> and it's just my way of saying, my God is bigger than you, pal. Amen? And, and, I, and I learned that when I was reading her book. And I was like, you do this? And it's so cool. But... But grammatically, in many cases, that's incorrect. But, but I don't do that out of any other thing except reverence and respect for Almighty God. And, um, and so even the, the writers of the Hebrew Bible reverenced and revered the name of God. In ancient times, when a scribe was, you know, they didn't have printing presses. They had to rewrite the Bible by hand. They had a, a quill pen. And, and, they would, and when, a, when a scribe would come to the name of God, he would, before he would write that name, this was their practice, they would get up, they would go and they would bathe themselves, they would put on fresh clothes that had never been worn before, they would get a fresh quill that had never been, had ink on it before, and they would write his name, then they would discard that quill and it would never be used again. That's how much they reverenced the name of God. And in church, how different it is today. These days, God's name is used so flippantly and as an, ex as an expression of anger or surprise. And you're hard-pressed to turn on the TV. You can't even, you can't even watch a, a home improvement show. Once they have the big reveal, they all say the same thing every time. You know, and, you, and, 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 and it's maddening to me because I think this is such a great moment and you just profaned it. By diminishing the holy name of God. And, and, you're, and we'd be hard pressed to, 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 to find a, a movie or pick up a novel or, or even listen to the radio without hearing God's name used in a casual or irreverent way. Using his name in vain. What does that even mean? Using God's name in vain. The, the word vain has actually two definitions and ironically they are juxtaposed. They, they are opposite. Uh, of each other. One uh, definition of the name of the word vain means having or showing excessively high opinion of oneself, your appearance, your abilities, your worth. Um, you've heard that old Carly Simon song, You're so vain. You probably think the song is about you. You're so vain. You know what I'm talking about, right? You probably think the song is about you. All right. Bunch of heathens. What are you listening to that stuff for? <laughs> the, other, the other definition of vain means useless. 
uh, like, forgive me for my political explanation here, but Biden accusing Putin for the extreme gas prices is a vain attempt to cover up his poor policies. Okay? Now, <laughs> sorry. I'm not trying to be political. I'm just tired of $5 gas. That's all. And, and, and so this is the context of this commandment. So when you use God's name in vain, that means you are invoking God's name in a worthless and empty way. There's no substance to what you're saying. There's no reverence, no value to what you're addressing. To use his name in vain means that you don't ask you're not asking, don't, do, when you use his name in vain, do not ask God to curse something. When, when you, listen, people use GD together, you are, what you are asking God to do is something that is completely opposite of his nature. God does not curse, God does not do that. John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come. That you'll have life and you'll have it to the full. And who did he come for? Us. Everybody. He came while you were still a sinner. Did you deserve the curse? Absolutely. Should you burn in hell? A hundred percent. But he sent his only begotten son to save your soul. To give you an opportunity. So why would he ever curse that which he has given so much to bless? He says in his word, his blessings are new every morning. And great is his faithfulness. He says that his blessings uh, fall upon the, the, uh, the, the, the wicked and the good. That he is, he, is, he is a good, good father. Church, it is, it is Satan's nature to curse things, to damn things, not God's. God is the life giver. God the Father sacrificed everything and made every effort possible to provide everlasting life. So we should not ask Him to evoke death and destruction on the very people that He gave His only begotten Son for. You want God to destroy something or someone just because it didn't work toward your advantage? That's vain. That's vanity. To think that you have the right to demand that of God, that's vanity. Of course, our response is, I didn't mean it that way. That's not what I meant. Well, that's a pretty poor excuse when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I didn't mean it. You had your chance for repentance. And I would respond that when you use his Powerful name in an empty and useless manner. By definition, it's vanity. So, you're commanding God to cast something to hell for eternity. Is that really what you want to happen? Do you really want that to happen? James chapter 3 verse 9 says this. When with the tongue we praise the Lord our Father and with, the, and with it curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. So in the midst of all we are not to do, we need to also know that there's some things that we should do when it comes to announcing the name of God, using God's name. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says, Whatever we do or whatever we say, we are to do it in the name of Jesus. As a Christian, our life should always be behind his name. That's why the Bible says that he is our banner. He is our victory. We're, we're under his flag. Amen? And so when we represent him, when you're talking to a friend, when you're singing, when you're preaching, when you're praying, when you're joking, when you're playing around, remember Jesus is right there in the room with you. Amen? This means that we should not be gossiping. I did. I'm still waiting for an amen. Listen, calling somebody up and saying, well, I'm just telling you this so you can pray about it. That's called gossip. Listen, we, 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 we shouldn't be spreading rumors about people. We shouldn't be making promises that we don't plan to keep. Let your tongue be an instrument 
of God's glory. Lift up your brother. Pray for them. Listen, you don't need to call up somebody and say, I'm just calling so you can pray. You can get on your face and you can call upon the Holy Spirit and lift up that brother or that sister all by yourself. You're so holy, lead them. Pray for them. Don't break them down. This means we've got to be, we, we, we should not be telling crude and tasteless jokes. We're Christians. We are Christians. We are followers of Christ. We should be praising and glorifying God with everything that we say and do. And people say, well, that sounds so lame, Pastor. <laughs> Amen. We, we, we find salvation in the name of Jesus. This is the best use of the name of God. Acts chapter 4 says, there is no other name in heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9, God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him what? The name that is above every name, that at his name every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Romans chapter 10, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You are saved by his name, confessing with our mouth and believing in our hearts that God raised him. Think of the names of Jesus from Isaiah. He's called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Great Shepherd. What do you think about when you hear the name of God? The Bible has so many names for God, we talked about it a minute ago. That's because it's impossible to capture the full character of God in any one attempt. So why do, what does all this mean? Very simply, it means this. We've got to be wise with how we use our tongue. We, what, when, what, what we say and how we say it has a direct correlation to our relationship with the Lord. It means that we don't misuse, we don't make idle oaths, or we don't use God's name in empty, worthless ways. It means that when we talk to other people, we don't swear as if it means nothing. Instead, we should honor the name of God. God's name represents life to me and to you. There are many ways we can use God's name in our speech that will be a blessing. The Bible gives us ways to honor his name and as I close, I'm just going to ask you to stand with me. I'll share with you some ways that we can glorify his name. Genesis chapter 12 verse 8 says, we can call on the name of the Lord. Psalm 129 verse 8 says, you can bless in the name of the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 22 verse 16 says, you can tell the truth in the name of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 24 verse 15 says you can exalt the name of the Lord. Jeremiah 26 16 says speak in the name of the Lord. Psalm 7 17 praise the name of the Lord. Psalm 102 verse 1 declare the name of the Lord. There are many ways we can use God's name in our speech to bring honor to him. Let's make sure that we honor God through our speech and show the world who Jesus is with our lives so that when they see you, the paired association is nothing short of one who's been changed and transformed by the blood of Christ and that your life is a reflection of his glory. Amen? We are his hands and feet, church. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me so we can pray. Father... In the mighty name of Jesus, Yeshua, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, the name that is greater than any other name, it's in that name that every knee bows and every tongue confesses. It's in that name that devils shrill. It's in the name of Jesus that hope abounds and that peace enters into their hearts. And it's in the name of Jesus that souls are saved. And so today, Father, in that name, Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, as we go throughout our day, no matter how hard things get, no matter how many times we strike our thumb, I pray, Lord, that we would always reverence the holy name of Jesus, the holy name of God, and God, that we never, ever are found guilty of taking your name 
in vain. Lord, we just thank you for that. I pray your blessing over this congregation as we prepare to go today. Lord, help us to be light in this dark world. Help us, Father, to be full of your spirit. May your peace surpass our ability to understand. May we be driven by the hope that is in us. And may we give glory to you in our everyday life. And we give you all the praise for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Okay, God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming to church today. Have a blessed day, and we will see you next week.